Hello and happy Thanksgiving for those listening in the U.S. And thank you to all of our listeners. We appreciate you and your support. Welcome to the Direct Approach Podcast with Wayne Moorhead. In today's episode, Wayne is joined by Garrett McGrath, President of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals. With a career in direct selling that spans more than 30 years, Garrett is a respected leader with a profound understanding of the channel. He has built field organizations of more than 150,000 distributors in 21 countries, and most recently served as CEO and president of a publicly traded network marketing company. Since 2012, Garrett has also served as president of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals. As a passionate advocate for the future of the channel, he leads through a simple and straightforward approach that understands the different habits, traits, and practices of corporate and field leaders and works to bring them together for effective collaboration. In this episode of Direct Approach, Garrett talks about the three types of people in network marketing and how companies can appeal to each. Then Wayne and Garrett talk about everything from collaborating with field leaders, creating bespoke onboarding experiences, customer community groups, and how to plug into what's working in social media right now. Finally, he shares why he believes the next 10 years can be the best decade for direct selling. Before we begin, we invite you to save the dates for the annual DSN Global Celebration, known as the Oscars of Direct Selling, and DSU events taking place Tuesday, April 18th through Thursday, April 20th, 2023 at the Omni Frisco Hotel in Frisco, Texas. You'll hear from some of the brightest leaders and experts in the channel to help you grow your organizations and your business. Before we begin, DSN is honored to be supported by industry suppliers that partner with companies across the channel to help enhance, streamline, and grow their businesses. This episode's sponsors are Nexio and Infotrax. Nexio was purpose-built to solve the payment problems direct sellers face. Their unified platform simplifies the complexity of the payments industry and helps you design forward-thinking strategies. Nexio empowers you to take control of commerce strategy, orchestrate payouts to distributors, optimize your transactions to grow your revenue, and maintain the flexibility to overcome obstacles in the ever-changing world of payments. Learn more at nex.io. That is N-E-X dot I-O. And when rapid growth or international expansion place demands on your business your systems aren't prepared to handle, success itself can be a potential cause of failure. As you grow, your system's requirements change, and nothing is worse than being hard-coded into a corner. The Infotrax platform was built with growth in mind, allowing the freedom to adjust your system at any time to align with your current business needs. Learn more at infotraxis.com. That is I-N-F-O-T-R-A-X-S-Y-S dot com. And now, please help me welcome your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest, Garrett McGrath, president of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach Podcast. I am your host, Wayne Moorhead, and I'm very excited to be speaking today with someone who has 30 years in the direct selling industry. He has led a field organization of more than 150,000 distributors across 21 countries. He has served as CEO and president of a publicly traded network marketing company, and for the past 10 years, has served as president of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals, none other than Mr. Garrett McGrath. Garrett, welcome to the Direct Approach. Well, I want to say this, Wayne, and I know it's sort of, you're used to people saying, I love you, appreciate you, I'm on your podcast, thank you for inviting me. But I'm one of those people who truly, with my wife, Sylvia, I probably watch all the podcasts. And I really love, because I believe this, I also love your background. The fact that you have a D to C direct to consumer background, you have a deep knowledge of digital, you understand te- technology, your brother and you, you geek out on network marketing. And I mean that in a positive way. I mean, I love reading marketing books and I love the fact that you love the cutting edge and you're not afraid to talk about what is that progressive integration of what's going on in digital, social, direct to consumer together with direct sales, you know, affiliate marketing, network marketing, make that handshake 
a progressive new opportunity. And I believe that's what the future looks like. So I'm very excited about the conversation. I really love the DSU. This uh, that We just came back from a couple of weeks ago. But you do a great job, and we're a fan, and both my wife and I watch it every time it comes out, anytime you write something. And I also, the DSU, um, the direct selling news, I love that as well when it comes out. So I'm a fan. I think there's no one of us is smarter than all of us. And that's what I love about what you guys all do here. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Well, thank you. Um, and that was just beautifully put. Definitely, um, we're much better and, and can, um, you know, go a lot further when we put all of our heads together. But yeah, it has been incredible. And again, as you mentioned, I do geek out on direct selling. I geek out on marketing and branding and advertising. And, and people had the chance at DSU to meet my brother, which was a cool experience for me, for both of us to, to be there. Obviously, um, some genetic similarities. The gene pool in the Moorhead family doesn't run super deep. So uh, we definitely look and sound quite a bit alike. But yeah, we absolutely geek out on, on this stuff. And that's why it's so fun for me. Each one of these podcasts is a chance for, for me to learn and, and to dig deeper on principles and practices. And honestly, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this conversation, um, especially after getting to meet you finally in person um, at that DSU event and your amazing family. And I, I was actually going to mention this on stage. Your son has the coolest job that I've ever heard of. He manages online gamers. Is that correct? Manages it and is. coaches online gamers. He has his own Discord channel. And they have like over a thousand people that come into that channel. It's like a community. But they run community events. But they also play Rust. And they have bounties and money. And he runs better than half of the top 10 teams in the world. So he has actually carved a niche out from because he loves this and he represents these uh, online um, Rust gaming teams. And they're mainly North America, but some of them from Australia, New Zealand, I mean, from Europe play in the same time zone as well. And yeah, he's made quite a bit of money, nearly $10,000 doing oh that, which is a lot of fun for him. Yeah, you should be really proud. That, that is amazing. And another thing that he represents, he represents the future of how people are going to look at jobs, uh, side gigs, um, additional income. There are so many other opportunities, things that we don't even think of like managing online gamers. I mean, these are viable options for people now to make, again, what you just said, more than $10,000. And he is 15, 16, 15. 15 I know. Yeah. He's, he's six, six. I know. He's, but Wayne, I think that's one of the blessings is that social media is his native tongue. Discord yeah. is his native tongue. You know, going on, he has an account, Skillshare, and he goes on and learned how to, you know, build bots, chatbots, and different bots that can run different routines to run these big channels and run these big communities. And they love that. And they come together and they collaborate online. His friends are in the United Kingdom, they're Australia, different time zones. I mean, on New Year's Eve, they're all coming together. They watch a movie together. They play a game together. I mean, they're doing multiple things in this Discord channel. So you're right on. It also keeps us grounded in the knowledge that how he views online world is like the same as the IRL in real life. And he also goes yeah. to school online. So <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, he's the litmus test. He's the canary in the coal mine for, for all of us. So it's got to be amazing to have somebody that's, you know, so in tune with the social and digital culture that's happening and all the changes there right under your roof. And, and again, just showing the example of what, um, how, how things are moving and to some degree, what we in direct selling and network marketing are competing with. And again, it's time, it's options. There's these incredible options for people out there. And we need to make sure that we have this incredible value proposition to, to help, you know, steer people towards us because they do have so many options today. So Sylvia and I also have two uh, other children, you know, 37 and 35 years of age. So Liam's our 15-year-old and we got Philip and Victoria. And Victoria, you know, lives in Sweden. You know, Philip lives in San Antonio. And what I say is it keeps us, as you said, in with the different generations and mm -hmm. understanding how they like to communicate, you know, going back to, you know, when everything is on text, uh, you should text before you call. What can we do on text? You know, right. Facebook, Facebook, you know, FaceTime. For Liam, if you want to get a hold of him, it's Discord. So there's different mm -hmm. ways of communicating with one another. So yes, it, it makes a big difference being able to tap into that. 
It is absolutely amazing. And I can tell like both of us are already like, you know, chomping at the bit to get into some of this conversation before we get too far down the road. I'd like to hear a little bit more of your origin story and what led you into uh, direct selling. And also, can you share just a little bit about the association of network marketing professionals? Without a doubt. I mean, so I studied international marketing and foreign trade in Germany and in Ireland and I grew up in a very entrepreneurial background. My dad had over 50 engineers and architects and associated professional people that worked in the firm with them in Galway in the West of Ireland. When I was born, it was about 28,000 people. And, you know, it's grown from there. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial background. I knew I bet I've got dyslexia, I've got dysgraphia, you know, I've got ADD, I've got ADHD, I've got, you know, obsessive compulsive behavior, so is my youngest son. So... I don't know if I was ever going to fit into the academic world, but my parents gave me the best education possible. I went to boarding school, probably wasn't excited about it at the time, the same boarding school that the president of Ireland went to. And suddenly I graduated and I could have gone anywhere. And as a blessing it was in my life, my dad knew Sir Michael Grill. Sir Michael Grill has actually served on the board of a company that my dad had in the United Kingdom at the time. You may know his son better. His wife, Sir Michael Grills, is wife's name is Lady Sally Grills. Their son is Bear Grills. The gentleman. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So man versus wild. They introduced me to network marketing. So I had gone to meet Sir Michael Grills and he introduced me to all these different companies and opportunities in London. And Sally, Lady Sally Grills introduced me to network marketing at Baden Powell House, which was wow. at Jane, and it was David Hunt, James Hunt's brother, the guy, the Formula One racing car driver who was in that organization, the same organization. Yeah, that's where I started off. And I remember I saw PM, which is plenty of money, and PT, plenty of time to enjoy it. And that grabbed my attention because I'd seen people that make plenty of money, but I'd not seen the part of the equation where you've got plenty of time to enjoy it. Because I went to boarding school with a lot of CEO sons Mm -hmm. whose parents were very successful, but they maybe didn't have as much time in their lives. And that was an equation going, oh my gosh, if that's possible, I'm in. And I'll tell you, I, I literally sat in the front row because that Lady Sally Grill had me sit on the front row and they said this way. And I mean, I still remember, they said, if you're average and you build a business spare time, you can be financially independent three to five years. They said, if you do it part-time, you can do it in two to three years. And if you do it full-time, you can probably be financially independent in one to two years. And I remember thinking to myself, first of all, Sally, we're going to be rich. And she looked at me, what do you say? And I said, oh, first of all, I'm not average. <laughs> I remember looking at her. So <laughs> I've never knew this was existed. I said, I'm not going to do it spare time. I'm not going to do it part-time. I'm not even going to do it full-time. I'm going to do it all the time. <laughs> It may take me six months to a year. And I say that to you for a reason, because I never forgot that. And then two and a half years later, I was going broke enthusiastically. <laughs> 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 I say that there's an important lesson here, because what I didn't know was how to do it. But I did see the potential, because my dad said something to me at the time, and actually Jeff Olson repeated it as well at another time, which is, if there are people making 10 times the amount of money that you want to make in an industry or profession, then there's no one that's 10 times better than you. The potential in that, if you get good or when you get good, because nobody's 10 times as good as you, you can get better. And what I needed to learn was not only how to retail the product, but how to gain average to the leverage of building a team. In other words, going from the retail to like that affiliate model, we talked about the first level of leverage to team building leverage, which is, it's not what you can do that's important. It's what you can do and duplicate. And everything mm -hmm. right falls with leadership. I had to learn how to lead into network marketing. And I had to learn some things. You'll only raise your life up to the height of your lowest limiting belief. So I went on a journey and you know, I've learned from a lot of great leaders. That's I actually met as Stuart Johnson in London, <laughs> in a, in the Novotel Hotel in Hammersmith with Jeff Olson. And it was with Quorum, and that was about 30 years ago. So that's how far back it goes. It's been an incredible journey. I've had the opportunity to build in 
Europe, I built in Asia, built in North America, and I built old school. I've drank coffee and living rooms in a lot of those places. <laughs> That's awesome. What an incredible intro to network marketing. And I, I think a, a common theme in, in speaking to so many um, network marketing and direct selling leaders such as yourself and others, how these key people came into their lives early on in their lives and in their career. I mean, the fact that you met Stuart and Jeff and um, Lady Grills, I mean, is just incredible to me that they, they help set you on a path. And, you know, so many of these people are still in our lives and still influencing us, you know, 30 years later. Like, unfortunately, Sir Michael Grills has passed away, and he was an MP. I also got to eat in the House of Parliament. He taught me how to tie my very first Windsor knot as a tie. Remember that? You know, hanging out with Bear Grills, Lady Sally Grills. I mean, they were really incredible. And one of the important lessons that I learned was you need to learn how to make enough money your one month to be in business the next month. Because I went full time. I'm not saying you should do that. So please don't hear that. But I went full-time day one, and my dad's an old-school entrepreneur, and he basically said, Garrett, you've got to learn how to make enough money this month for you to have enough money to have the privilege of being an entrepreneur in business next month. And that was how I learned how to retail the product, and I learned some, and there were some great people that came into my life, and I'm very, very grateful for the mentorship and the people that I met along the way. I guess I was open to it, but also feel very blessed because... Personal growth is a big part of success within network marketing. You know, I've heard other CEOs say, they quote John C. Maxwell, he says, when you stop learning, you need to stop leading. And mm -hmm. I have the best to be- That's a great team. point. Yeah, and it was in the interview, that one of the interviews you did, I remember it when he's saying that, but I just remember saying that I love that aspect of network marketing. And I don't want to shy away from the NP, the Association of Network Marketing Professionals. Let me just quickly in one minute. Yeah, please. After I got, first of all, invited onto the board of that association and had not then became president of the association over 10 years ago. And really the concept is no one of us is smarter than all of us. And it's a grassroots organization, but there are three major stakeholders that I feel needed to be represented in one organization. The Direct Selling Association does a great job of representing the CEOs, the executives, the corporate owners, the founders. And, you know, DSU has done a fantastic job of bringing together all of those owners and founders together with all the vendors and all the suppliers and all the supporters under one roof. And my feeling was we needed an organization that had the field leaders that had the corporate leaders and had the supporters and the suppliers and the vendors who really shaped the industry because they create the tools and a lot of the technology we have access to together in one route and to stimulate conversation from those different points of view because I thought it gave a more 360 look at things. And that's really why it's there. It's a grassroots organization. And we have, you know, we have over 50, 60, 70, 80 speakers one year at our conference speak in this TED Talk style. We've been doing it for 10 years, you know, 17, 18 minutes. So that's it. And then we've also got events that are on, on a monthly basis online as well. That's really cool. Thank you for, for sharing about the organization. And I think you're absolutely right. Our potential, those three stakeholder groups, our potential, our future success is inextricably, inextricably connected. And so we, we all need each other. We're all different um, kind of pillars in the, in the same house. And so I think it's really interesting that you bring all those groups together. That's really powerful. And, and I want to say, you know, big shout out to Stuart Johnson for being so generous because he's on the board of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals. And I feel like that him, you know, being on the board has elevated our board as well because Stuart is probably one of the most networked people, you know, out there. I want to say. Yeah. yeah, I can vouch for that too. It's amazing. Yeah. It's and absolutely he loves amazing. The channel. He, you know, you and yeah. I know that, you know, when you speak with Stuart, and he's the reason I've had the opportunity to speak three times at DSU, two, twice online and once in person. And I don't want to take that for granted because he shares the same belief that we should all be together and tap into the intellectual capital that does exist within the room. And how do we elevate the entire, you know, um, channel? So I'm very excited about that. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I am as well. Stuart is um, amazing at bringing us all together and, and helping kind of raise all of the ships. It's something I, I'm very grateful for him um, as well. 
So jumping back, you know, we were able to see each other a couple of weeks ago. I, again, I finally had the chance to meet you. I had loved your, I'd seen your video speeches, had never had a chance to really meet you in person. I did at DSU. It was amazing. We had kind of a conversation that night. Um, after one of the workshops where we started geeking out, we've had a conversation on the phone where we've kind of started geeking out and it's amazing. I, I can tell that we kind of uh, um, really help kind of push each other a little bit in, in a really interesting way. Um, and so that's why I have been so excited about this. But, but in that conversation, um, I was kind of mentioning and observing how so many of the, the presentations and the discussions had centered around the changing direct selling landscape and what are some of the dynamics and, and elements that are changing. And you said something, and I'm going to paraphrase and probably get it slightly wrong, um, but I've, I've reflected on it several times uh, since that conversation because for me, it was really profound. You said something to the effect of the things in direct selling aren't changing. It has changed. Yeah. I mean, really definitively, it, it has changed. And so I think even um, looking at it through that lens kind of changes how we approach and discuss that we have been kind of sharing. And, you know, I'm guilty of this as well on this podcast, talking about some of these things that are kind of coming down the pike a little bit that, that eventually we will, you know, end up meeting. But a lot of this has really already happened. And we're probably just becoming aware and more cognizant of what some of these changes are. So I'd love with your perspective, um, with, you know, being on, um, you know, as president of the organization that you are, your perspective is, is really unique and incredible. So I'd love to dig in and get your take on what some of these changes are, some of these things that you're seeing and, and where a lot of this opportunity lies. So I, I'd like to start out with even like all the way upstream at really how we define direct selling. One of the things that um, became very apparent at, at DSU and, and that we've noticed is kind of this, this blending of different channels, how CPG and D2C brands are starting to build multi-tiered commission structures. They have affiliate programs, they have influencer programs, they have referral programs. And so I'm curious, do we need to start looking at what defines a direct selling company differently than we have in the past? So I want to first of all acknowledge that I'm blessed being president of the Association of Network Marketing Professionals, we have 17 people on the board. And every year we do a conference. Plus, we have many events digitally throughout the year. So this next year is on in June, you know, the first or the fourth, it's in Dallas. But as part of that, we start off having 50 speakers, and we have had as many as 80. So I will speak with literally hundreds of distributors, vendors, company owners to decide who's going to be on that stage. So we have a really good blend across section of people, not the same people all the time, because there's new perspectives, you know, who are the right, you want the Hall of Famers and the, you know, the all-stars, and then you want the rising stars. And I say that for a reason, because it keeps me, I believe the meek shall inherit the earth. That doesn't mean those weak of will, it means those humble enough of spirit to realize that iron, iron sharpens iron, but there's lots of different people and perspectives you can learn from. So I get tapped into that and you begin to understand the changes and also having, as you said, a 15 year old, a 37 year old, 35 year old, you also see those as well. So let's go back into what, you, what I said was that network marketing has changed. The challenge I think for a lot of corporate companies is they don't know what the field really does to generate sales in the field. They believe that they do, and I'm not knocking this. I've been a CEO, I've been president, I've been on the C-suite, so is my wife, been president of the Association of Network Marketing Professional. I love network marketing. And tapping into having people not just give you the sanitized surface soundbite that they know corporate wants to hear, but what is it that you're <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? What is it you're actually doing? Oh, sure. You, you know what I mean? In other words, the dollars are in the detail. Like you and I talked about, you know, if you've got D 2 C direct to consumer marketing, you've got social media, it's the details that make a difference. Like they say, well, we've got an onboarding strategy or they've got, you talked about sequencing and you talked about segmentation of lists. We'll get to that in, you know, part of the podcast. Some of the social network marketers that you have are already there. Yeah. They already have lists. There are guys that are using Infusionsoft in their own list that they're driving, they have a better CRM in the field than the company does. And I've seen that and companies go, what? 
they've got, yeah, like they call it confusion salt. For example, if you want to stay current, I believe this, you know, Sylvia and I hired so a coach this year, Ray and Jessica Higdon, you know, we invested $30,000 with them because I said, I don't have time to stay current with all the changes in social media, where everything's happening in network marketing with everything. And even though I put on the Association of Network Marketing Professionals event and had done that for three months, we still worked with Ray to give us more inputs so you can get more perspectives. And I will tell you the level of sophistication, I'll give you an example. There are field leaders today who have a better database of what the field do and are than the company does. Let me give you an example. So when they onboard people, remember this phrase, it's not how much love that you have for someone that's important. It's how much love they feel that you have for them. So you need to know what their love language is. But if all you have is one onboarding email with one way, then you're only hitting some people sometimes and you're rarely hitting them in their love language. So there are leaders who have a level of sophistication. When they onboard people, they fill out a questionnaire, which is, what is your Facebook handle? So in other words, so we can find your account. Are they on Instagram? Are they you know, on Messenger? How do, you know, what do they like if, you work and hit a rank. What are the things that are important to you? You know, your shirt size, you know, vacations. I mean, they have so much information so that they can personalize recognition. What type of books do you like to read? You know, they've got, you know, your pet's name, birthdays, anniversaries. I'm not sure that there is many companies that are gathering that information, but I know distributors that have groups and they also have leveraged technology where they've already automated that and companies don't do any of that. True or not true? Answer the question. Yeah, companies- I, yeah, yeah. I, I, see, um, I see that as well. There's some companies that are definitely farther ahead than others. But I will say emphatically that the, the distributors now, the brand partners with technology, with um, e-commerce, with social commerce, they are light years ahead of, of us. We, we are catching up to them. We're still trying to figure out and learn um, what they're doing. And by the time we kind of figure it out and, and socialize it and commercialize it internally, they're already kind of onto the next thing. It's it's a different platform. It's a different approach. You said one thing, and I know we're going to get into to some of this a little bit later in the conversation, but you said there's some companies that might have like that one onboarding email or the one welcome email. Well, I would say most of us probably have one welcome or distributor journey. So even if we've built out the entire journey, a lot of times we, you know, and I've been there where, where you, you map it all out and, and you, you know, identify the touch points and, and all the communications and assets that are going to happen at each one of those. And you kind of congratulate yourself. And that's one journey. And there's so many journeys now. And, and especially today, there's, I think, two really bright ones. There's people coming in that just want to share product. They, they don't want to build a team. They just want to come in. They want to share products within their social circle and within their social followers. And then there's those that sincerely do want to build a team. And like, like you, jump in with both feet and, and want to go full time and, and really dig in deep. And we have to get really good at understanding that there's multiple journeys and creating bespoke experiences for each of those audiences. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit as well? Without a doubt. So there's so much to unpack with what you just shared right there. And we could do a whole hour just in the part. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. The dollars are in the details. In fact, Stuart Johnson and I spoke after I shared so much information on my last talk. He said, hey, congratulations. You got a standing O. But he said, I thought you were going to become a consultant. You shared so much information. I want to give some value. So let me just unpack some of the things. So there, I think there are three bespoke experiences. And the challenge, if you don't know that this is exactly what this person's interested in, and if you go too far with it, you actually push them away. Yep. You need to understand that some communications are, are, not do, are not helping you. So if it's not necessary to say it, it's necessary not to say it. Listen to what I just said. If it's not necessary to say it, it's necessary not to say it. And that is something that D2C really understands, which is what does your person want to hear that's in alignment with why they're actually there for the onboarding journey? So there, as a minimum, there are three groups of people. Number one is exactly like you said, the person who doesn't even want to be an affiliate at this point, they're just going, I'd like to share some products 
that potentially might help me make some money or have some friends who go on a health journey with me or do something together with me, that is one distinct group of people. So how do you improve their experience? And I love what Magnus and some of the other speakers spoke about. If you're going to tap into network marketing and not just be commoditized, not just be a D to C, a direct to consumer technology company, you've got to embrace the community aspect. And the super part of the community aspect is communicating them in the way they want to be communicated with, and then wrapping the experience around with the distributor, but not undoing it with other communications. So let's look at that very first one. You're right on. Some people that go, I'd love to learn how to sell the product. And it's having customer communities because in community, people feel together. They feel like it's easier to go on a journey. They see social proof and it's an enjoyable experience. So now companies are more sophisticated and they know that there are communities online that they can create with the field. And that's something else we'll talk about. Who's running that customer community? Is the one the field using, is that a field-driven one or a corporate one? Because sometimes the company does have a Facebook customer community, but because the field doesn't get to collaborate with us, they check the box and say, we have it. They're able to get people into it because they send out an email and say, join us. But then they find out later that that's not the one the field is really driving engagement with and working in. But the reason they see the one that they have growing is they send out an email to their customers saying, join this community. So they're seeing it grow. But what that is, that is correlation, not causation. Those two things got separated from one another. And there's somebody sitting there, oh, we're doing a great job. This is growing. But they're realizing it's not the one that's actually growing the customer group. So that part is important. So how do you join it together? And I think it's really important to understand the customer group is offering value. What is it? What is the benefit of the benefits? What's the human reason? What's the feeling that the person wants to feel and experience and get the value of in the community even before they might buy the product or service? Because in most points, that's part of the selling mechanism. It gets the customer in. Then it keeps them in because you can then begin to say, hey, you know what? There are some unexpected experiences that you may or results you might get with this product. There are unexpected benefits of the benefit with this product or service that you may not be thinking about. So one of the things that I've seen that sophisticated distributors do, and I learned this from not my understanding of it, I actually had to be thought it, is a lot of times people add tag and message or add some to the community tag them to a important tool or message that's in there and then message them and say, hey, I thought about you, I sent you this. They do that prolifically until the customer buys the product and then they stop. But then you want to continue it on because you want people to get into the community, stay in the community because they're getting value. And what happens is then the person uses the product, they get other benefits, they notice the benefits. When you notice the benefits, you're adding to the value, and suddenly that value column was going up and up and up. So when it comes to reordering, they're reordering. You're not starting that communication at the end of the month and going, hey, it's time for your auto ship to run. But instead, you want to have it be an experience along which when they get to the end of the month, they're going, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I think there's some other benefits I might join. I definitely want to get it the next month. In fact, I think I might bring my brother or my mother or my friend or my colleague or my next door neighbor into the community so they can go along this community journey with me. And that's just the customer side. And I could give you loads of ideas. You know, I think it's important that companies that have contests that they work with the field and create contests that creates more engagement with the customer in there. In fact, I'm not going to get into, but one of the things I thought was really funny, I just saw one recently. I was in someone's customer community and they were having customer community bingo one night and they were using it as a way online to play bingo to give prizes to customers. And through doing so, it was teaching them about the products because the name of their That's products, great. their products were on the bingo card that they were playing electronically and going, how creative is this? I mean, I was going, that's awesome. I mean, Ryan, just, I was invited on by, I said, man, that's great. I'm trying to share with you the creativity, like you said, Wayne, I thought it was um, 
very insightful of you and, and Stuart when you guys shared that about the distributors being perhaps further down the social media selling journey than the companies are. I've never heard an environment corporately that's organized by Stuart Johnson and you, you guys saying that, but I know it kind of raised a few eyebrows in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we definitely like to mix it up a little bit. I've been CMO at, at multiple direct selling companies. So when I make a comment like that, it is in no way, um, or, or Stuart, it, it's not critical. It's, we're all in this. And so we, we all need to evolve and, and we just need to understand that we obviously have infrastructure and platforms and systems and practices and policies and history and all these things that add complexity on our side where the distributors are, are less encumbered. They can move much faster. They are on the front lines. They know literally minute by minute now with, you know, with, when they deploy assets and, and communications, what's working, what's not. And they can really figure out very quickly what is, what isn't, and how to tweak and optimize and then scale those campaigns. And we should take a lesson. We should be grateful that they're out there, um, again, that they're figuring this out. And let's draft off some of that. I want to circle back to a couple of things you were just saying about these kind of three distinct groups and, you know, the, kind of the customer group, the, you know, whether it's they want to buy the product, share the product, or build a team. Mm -hmm. Where in the past, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to point the finger back at myself, you know, in, in previous roles where we kind of spoke to really as if it was one audience, you know, we had the bullhorn, we were speaking to one audience. It was all the same message. We were great at being consistent. We were great at getting the word out. And now we do need to understand that there are these different groups. And I think that's, and you, you mentioned this in, in our conversations and, and on stage that getting into the segmentation, creating these experiences and communications that are tailored for each of these, um, that is a huge opportunity. And so at a minimum, I think what companies need to do is get those, you know, marketing automation platforms, the CRM platforms where, whether it's Klaviyo or, or HubSpot or, or any of these others that allow them to identify these, these groups mm -hmm. by their behavior. We're not guessing. So we, we know if they take certain action that that can then trigger a different communication, a different email and help kind of hold their hand down these paths but they do want these personalized experiences. That's one of the beauties of social and technology is we have the opportunity to have these more personalized relationships. And so that's one thing I would do tomorrow. You know, you talked about the, the distributors, some of them having, you know, better and more ro robust databases. They do. I mean, a lot of them do. Some of them have better tools, but that's one thing, you know, that list, the list is king. The list is gold. We've got to, We've got to have those databases where we are gathering the as much information, not just about them. It's not just kind of, hey, let's get some demographic information, but it's behavioral over time. It's purchase behavior. It's building behavior. It's recruiting behavior. We have the ability to really zoom in. So anyhow, I'm going to step off my soapbox because I want to, <laughs> I want to hear more about it. If you're right on track. It's like I've learned from other distributors. They've learned how to automate the onboarding into a community. Most people just add someone to a community. There are some leaders who have now got these different plugins that they work with Facebook. Well, when the person joins the community, they have they ask them different questions, which is getting their email address, getting this other information that they're looking for. And it gives them the opportunity to communicate, not just in that community, but in another platform as well, which creates another level of security. And I do believe that I love... At DSU, I got so much notes. There's so much learning out there. There's so much great information shared. As I said in my talk, it's not a critique and it's not a love letter. I'm not trying to say anything critical. I'm trying to say there's opportunities to learn and you can be both compliant and compelling because sometimes the field also needs the working together with corporate so that some things you know, just get shaped or shared in a different way. Like, give, let me give you another example. Like, customer stories can help someone repurchase the next month. Because if you have stories, if you run a competition, which is unexpected benefits from your product or service, and you have the field and the customers send those in, ideally customers share them. And then corporate turns them into very short video snippets. I'm talking like sometimes 20 seconds, 30 seconds, but very quick but not feeling like marketing. It just feels like it was shot on the phone because that's very clear what that is. 
Now it's compelling. They know what shouldn't be what in there that moves them, but it's also compliant. Imagine if got more of those being deployed and people, when they come up, customers come in there, distributors learn, hey, tag them in this little video, tag them with that little video. You say, when I saw this video, I thought of you. Simple campaign, different ideas that you can do. And that's what I'm talking about is us learning together, like the unboxing video, like giving the field ways to create really interesting, you know, um, unboxing videos and I love the way it was shared but not giving the game away where it's an unboxing video that doesn't give you all the information but it's a conversation starter and understanding how to do that and giving tools to the field that's what I mean by collaboration all doing it together I think there's another level of growth and I know you put that down there a lot collaboration how important it is working together I believe in that. Absolutely. Um, they are amazing resources, not only for learning, but as you mentioned, unboxing videos for content. Um, a little bit of um, kind of a corollary here. In my D2C life, one of our most successful converting videos or, or ad assets was a customer's unboxing video that we, we reached out to them and said, hey, can we use this from a corporate perspective? And we put ad dollars behind it. And it was something that they had made in literally a couple minutes on their iPhone. And it was our one of our absolutely best performing assets that we had. So they are our members, our distributors are incredible resources for this type of content. And I think as I mentioned there at DSU, you know, in a, 10 years ago in a prior life, I would have said, no, that's not going to reflect great on the brand. And it's got to come from corporate and it needs to have this tone and consistent. And now it's like, man, let's just get great content, you know, from wherever it comes, whether it comes from corporate, from customers, from the field. Um, and so there is that, I think, opportunity to collaborate more than we ever have and to share and support one another more than we ever have. I wrote down the line that you shared. I'll always attribute it was so brilliant. You said the previous way. And I don't like the word old school. I always like to say I'm schooled in the old ways. I'm just not stuck in them. The challenge with old school, it's got sort of an emotional attachment to it. But previously, what we might have done, like you said, was command and control, top-down leadership. And you said, you know, we need to engage and empower. And I love the way you put that together because that really is what the next, what the future looks like. And again, it needs to be the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing. In other words, right. Future is not a presentation, it's a conversation. The future is authenticity. And it, when you overly produce it, it becomes marketing. So the fact that it was shot on an iPhone, now you may just adjust a little bit to make sure it's still compliant, but you maintain the authenticity and then the accessibility. In other words, the audience looks at it going, I relate to that person. So that's why you need to be authentic, you know, a little bit aspirational, but accessible. And that's hard to keep those all together yeah. And if you do that, I, I think then it becomes more integrated and less interruptive, like, you know, previous generations of advertising have, it was interrupting a show, it's interrupting, you know, something you're reading, and to have it being integrated into people's feel into their um, uh, social feeds, and into their lives more into their conversations and communications. It's just a more natural and effective approach from a communication and advertising standpoint. And one of the things, you know, over the last six months, I was privileged to be in a place to really focus and learn that. And I asked her son, Liam, are there any good social influencers that you like that you think we should follow on YouTube? Because he likes to say YouTube is further along. It's like it's it's out there in the further edges. And then it comes into maybe like an Instagram and then eventually, you know, a Facebook. But you look at that and you begin to see where is marketing going? Like, have you... You asked me before, you know, about marketing, where is it going? And I said to you that I really believe there's going to be this progressive integration of what's going on in the direct-to-consumer world and learning what they've learned. Like, when is the last time someone went to an Infusionsoft seminar? Because, and I'm not saying, I'm just picking that one out because it's the sure. market. You know, Russell Brunson's, you know, seminars and learning from the click funnels. I'm not saying you need to go in that direction, but looking at what it is that they're learning and sharing. Have you gone to an influencer conference? Have you gone to a social media conference? I mean, these things, you know, my son brought us to I remember Minecraft was a thing. We went to Minecraft conferences. Um, 
you know, he wants to go to next year. He's got this conference he wants to go to. When's the last time as a marketer or as a business leader, given that that is the future, it is coming. It's just how fast is it going to come and how much influence is going to have on our channel just to pick up some ideas or maybe stimulate your brain or, but if we only lock on to the challenge and say, we can never figure that out, then we're going to lock on and lock out the growth that's happening in this channel. And I personally think that's a mistake. I can't remember what the phrase is from Buck, Mr. Fuller, but he said, you know, how do you change something? You don't fight with the incumbent technology. You don't fight with the incumbent idea. What you do is you evolve it until the incumbent idea becomes obsolete. The challenge for us is we're not looking at marketing as it's changing because we live in it as compared to world. You said this when you and I were talking, you're not going to stop the evolution of this world, social media, the Amazonification of the world and all of this. And if we only focus on the challenge, the attribution challenges, then we're going to get to a place where we're ultimately going to lose the superpower of network marketing, which is the dis distributors. And I believe that that's the superpower. And you and I talked about, there are three different ways. Direct sale is number one. The second one is the affiliate marketing or ambassador marketing, which is single level attribution where someone goes, you can become an ambassador or an affiliate marketer. And we, we only have to track the customer sales that you do. And then the ambassador that introduced you that single level. And I know some companies were forced legally into that. And I understand what that looks like in our space. And I understand technologically, it is an easier transition because if you're paying out 35% on the front end in the retail aspect, and then another 10% in this aspect, and the attribution is easier, why not just stop there? And I think that's a whole different world. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad world. I'm just saying it's not this world where it is tapping into the distributor world. And that's the one that I believe in. I believe the companies that are going to succeed, you know, without mentioning names, there were some CEOs that I love that said, you got to figure out how to tap into that piece and still do conferences, still do recognition, still do, you know, the leverage leadership growth model. And how do we make all of that work in this new model? I think that's the challenge. I think that's the companies like Exigo and other technology companies are going to have to step up to. So I think the conversations are changing back to what you said, bespoke technology. I understand it's challenging. I understand that there are expenses. I understand it's complex, but I also understand the ones that figure it out are the ones that are going to win. It's definitely and not or. So right. I think we have to make sure we're adopting that mindset. We're not saying to abandon anything. We are continuing to leverage our greatest asset and differentiator, which is our, our members, our distributors, our, our brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. It's helping. It's working with them. It's amplifying. I, I think when, when people hear the talk of, of digital marketing or you know, in how D2C might do things, they might say, well, that doesn't work for us. You know, We can't go out and prospect. We can't Fine. Let, let's, let's put that argument aside just for a moment. You can deploy marketing automation. You can deploy paid social. You can deploy so many of these other things to your existing list. So those that are in your distributors organizations to drive greater sales, to increase the average order value, um, to increase the basket size, the lifetime value, all of these things without ever going too far upstream, we can stay right here for a little while, for probably even a long while, and get really good at helping to drive additional sales for our distributors within their organizations with some of these tactics, with some of these tools, and without ever having to have that other conversation. Um, I think that's something that the marketing teams need to get really good at, is deploying those types of tools to our members' organizations, they're our customers as well. And so we're just nurturing, we're just helping them along. We're just collaborating and partnering again to drive additional sales for them. And I don't think any distributor would argue saying, I don't like that you, you know, helped grow my business or you know, got this person to buy 30% more this month than they had the last six months. Um, but 
so I, I think that's even a great place to start is let's just start working on those that are already kind of within our, our brand families to start deploying some of this stuff. There's a lot there, but you have to have collaboration because if the field sees something deploying, and I know this, sometimes the field goes, are they trying to just make us obsolete? Are they trying to get rid of us? Is they're going to get to a point where they go, hey, you know what? The distributor side of it is just too complicated. We're just going to become a direct-to-consumer with a one-level affiliate program. And I will tell you, distributors are fearful of that. Sure. So you've got to just, just say, no, we're committed to this channel. We're committed to network marketing. We're committed to growth. We're committed to evolving together. And you've got to have the conversation. And I will say this, it's also interesting. You can't dial it in. I love network marketing. I've talked to lots of CEOs. But it was interesting to me that some CEOs, I mean, I'm just telling you, I took them off the list when they did this. So if they, I said, does anyone in the field have your cell phone number? To which a lot of people go, no. Are you in any group chats online or, you know, on Telegram or something with your top few leaders, like your circle of champions? They go, no. Do you have any social media presence at all? Like if I look at where's your social media presence that you lead or that you, I don't have one. Does anyone on your corporate team have any social media presence? No. And I know you're thinking, are there really companies today that don't do this? And there are, because I get it. It feels like, well, then I, there are no boundaries. I don't have a personal life. There are ways, a more sophisticated way to look at things and go, you can have your personal life, you can have your boundaries, but also we've got to have a way to people to feel communicated with. Remember what I said, it's not how much love and appreciation, appreciation you have for your field, it's how much love and appreciation do you feel like you have for them. And the field leaders, even though they may never use it, the fact that they have access to this information, you go, oh, I'll never get anything done. But also, you got to ask yourself the question, how connected do they feel with you? Some of the newer companies or some of the companies that you talk to that are doing two and 300 million a year, their CEO said, I do have my, my, my uh, cell phone number. I received texts on my birthday. I sent texts on I know you're smiling because you're remembering who they are. You know, <laughs> I am in a Telegram group with some of my top leaders. We do have Facebook Messenger chats that go from our corporate team with some of our field leaders because we want to have that instantaneous feedback and access to information. And it did take us a while to figure out how to do it. And there are people who abuse it and you have to take them out of it. And there's no one size fits all, but living it by absolute and not doing any of this, I just believe no one of us is smarter than all of us. And if the rest of the world is collaborating and communicating at hyper levels, we'll become irrelevant because we're no longer part of the communication. And people just don't feel like we love them, appreciate them, because they don't feel like we're communicating with them. Last thing I'll say is this. Too often, an industry, company, gets run by what's not said rather than what is said. In other words, by conversations that are not happening rather than conversations that are happening. And it's how much conversation is really happening with your field leaders. Because if it's not, they're not feeling appreciated. They're not feeling recognized. They're not feeling like they're part of it. And I think you want them to feel like that. And I know last, you know, I think one of your CEOs said, you know, who do you listen to? You know, a way to do this is, Let's say you look at a category like customer gathering, customer reordering. In other words, what person or people have got the highest reorder rate month two, month three, and month four? You could create recognition because you should have at least got access to that data. Who are the top 10 in their customers order reordering second, third, and fourth month? What if you put them together, learned how they're doing it, and then deploy it out into your organization and those would be the people that you would put out speaking at your next convention. What if you had your core rank? In other words, core rank growth. And you looked at you, this is the rank. And this is the growth. And you look at these, the top 10, you collaborate with them, work on a training, figure out ways to get that out into other organizations. There's so much that you can do. I'm not with my wife looking forward to the next 10 years in network marketing. I'm not looking forward to them. I'm looking forward to the next 10 best years. 
I want my next 10 years, I want network marketing to be to the best 10 years. I believe that we can do that with every fiber of my being. And I talked about that 1% improvement. I believe that with every fiber of my being. And I know there are corporate people on here who are feeling like, man, I'm not seeing this. And I believe that every company owner that's on here, CEO and executive team, I believe they've already got the talent corporately and in the field. They already have that talent. I believe the technology already exists. I believe it's not about the one thing. It's no one thing. It's and, 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 and. And I really believe in the 1%. I want you to take a second if you can. Would you mind talking about the three C's and the one, okay. the power of the 1% gains? So you referenced them. They're really important. They, they're kind of a huge impact in your organization. Can you touch on the three C's really quickly? Yeah, without a doubt. So this didn't come from out of nowhere. I had six months making a decision. One of those people that helped me was George Johnson. I want to say thank you to him. There were lots of CEOs that reached out to me. And I didn't know what my wife and I wanted to do. Did we want to start our own company? And would people reach out to us through that? Did I want to be back in the C-suite of other great companies? And I want to thank all of them that reached out and made those offers. Or do I want to go back in the field? So looking at it, I wanted to be clear and intentional. What did I feel is making the big difference? The first one is customer reorder rate. And the reason the reorder is so important that in the gig economy, I believe we should be growing like crazy in an economy where more people, there's a greater town pool of people looking for additional income today, particularly when it's fueled by inflation. But the challenge is we're not the only gig in town, literally. There, the gig economy is another option that's available to people. So we need to simplify how people can make money. And the difference with network marketing is when you buy a pro, when you sell a product to someone in network marketing, you made that sale. But when they repurchase, you can be paid that money again. And when they repurchase again, so there's no such thing really as residual income. There are repeat purchases which create repeat income. But that front end money is so important because that's where most people are coming on board. That's how they're beginning to say, do I have any entrepreneurial bone in my body and I'd like to do something? And when they get their first customer, I said, when you forget where you've come from, you're on your way back. I remember the anxiety of trying to get my first customer, my first group of customers and all of that. But the important piece of it is what happens to someone's confidence when the second month that customer does not reorder? Or that group of customers don't deorder? Do you think your confidence goes up or goes down? It goes down. So we should do everything we can to support that reorder. Because I believe when we're successful there, when we create more success there, you can create more growth. The second one is community. And... This is an important one. I believe that the most effective communi communities will be collaborative communities. In other words, the community was started off corporately by the company and the field collaborates with the creation of it. So it's as effective as it possibly can be. And that's also not normal. A lot of companies have their own community. The field also has communities. And I'm talking about communities for customer communities, communities that evolve people to that next level. They want, might want to become an affiliate. They want to be, might want to become a business leader. And how do they build a business? There are three or four different types of communities. And I think the company wants to create those together with the field. And you can create a better type of community that can be more effective than each one doing it on their own or a sort of collab. And I, and I do get how difficult it is. But the way people say, who should you listen to? Listen to the people who are really producing in the areas that you want to see growth in. Look for your outliers. Be careful. Don't let the exception become the distraction. Because remember, it's not just what you can do in network marketing. It's what you can do and duplicate. As long as you've got people coming together that understand that, you'd be amazed what you can create in your community. Then the next C is compensation. And I do believe this is changing. So I will say that Glenn Sanford, um, I love the way he shared and said, 
companies are going to have to reorganize and think about how they think of SG&A, how they organize their companies and the overhead and their C-suite expenses and all of that, which I know there was a lot of people in the audience, he was talking about digital, that they don't have a big headquarters. He was talking about, you got to become more digitally savvy. You got to figure out a way to get more productivity by having, you know, I believe this, you're going to have a C-suite's going to get younger, not older. I think it's going to change because you're going to get access to people who will come from the D to C world, come from the social world, who have got deep technology backgrounds. Social media is their first language, not their second. That's something that's really important. So you got to keep it simple. That's really, really important. It's got to be simple, but it's also got to be in the community. It's got to be competitive. You know, you're about to enter a really exciting chapter um, for you and your wife. So what about these changes that you're seeing, the shift in the landscape, this combining and blending, what excites you most about the future for direct selling in this next chapter for you? So I am, you know, truthfully excited, but it's based upon the facts as I see it. I literally see the next 10 years. I feel very blessed to be partnering with the company where I'm not the CEO, I'm not the president, I'm not in the C-suite, I'm going to go in the field. But I have a special advisor role with the CEO and the COO and founders that are willing to collaborate on a partnership level with Sylvia and I and with the field. So I'm very excited what can be created there. So I believe, and I believe our whole channel can win on the gig economy piece. I really believe we can because we can make our compensation as competitive as the gig economy. I believe that financially, but we've got two other pieces. We can make it simple, you know, add tag message. We really can make it simple, but we will pay you a repeat per, a repeat income because in the gig economy, for the most part, those guys that make a sale, they get paid one time. When that customer buys a second time, they don't get paid again. You can be make that repeat purchase and then you're not on your own. You're not getting in a car and going out on your own. You get to do this community style. You get to do this friend style. You get to do with other people. I believe... We actually have the winning formula on the front end. I believe that with every fiber of my being, we have that, and I believe that. I believe on the next part, the affiliate piece, we also have that as well, because we can do it in the community. Again, we can keep it simple, and we can keep it family style. We can have people go and friends do what friends do. We just need to make it fun. We can't make it this onerous. You know, that's another part of it, keeping it fun, keeping it light, really making it happen, and then having the leverage side of this. I really see that together we can create the type of successes that people are looking for, but I just mean it's going to be a lot of fun. I really feel that together, and I mean this, field leaders, corporate leaders, suppliers, vendors, thought leadership, coaches, coming together, no one of us is smarter than all of us. You know, our competition is not one another. It's Amazon. Our competition is the gig economy. Our competition is technology. Our competition is realizing the world's not changing. It has changed and it continues to change. And I love the brave way you described, because I believe it, that in some aspect, the field is ahead of corporate. But another aspect of the field also needs to be clear about what does it take to run a successful company as well? You can't just do something like that. There, you know, you can be nimble, you can be in chats, you, but you got to have boundaries. It's learning how do we work together? And I feel that that's the new future. And I feel that's what's going to happen. I believe that network markets, a lot of people who do a few simple things consistently over time, that works. So what does that translate into real people's lives? I believe that normal, regular people who would love the opportunity to make some extra money can do it together with us in a way that's simple, where they can make some money, they can do it in the community, they can leverage it into a single level where they can dip their toe in the water and see, maybe I'll introduce some other people and then eventually maybe get access to larger incomes. I believe that that journey, that evolution from being a customer to being paying for your product, you know what I mean? To make a little bit of money, to making a little more money, maybe hanging out here for a while and maybe going further with it. I truly believe that's the, what the world wants. They want it to be simple. They want it to be fun. They want it to be in a community. 
And I believe we can win. And if I can play any role, I want to be part of that. Thank you for being the incredible advocate for the channel that you are and for helping us look forward and backward and find new ways to, to get better and better. So thank you, Garrett, so much for your time today. Thank you for tuning in. We invite you to subscribe so that you're the first to know when new episodes are available. And please save the dates for the next DSU, an in-person only event, and the annual DSN Global Celebration, April 18th through April 20th, 2023 in Frisco, Texas. Registration will open soon. Thank you for listening and supporting DSN and the Direct Approach Podcast.